Okay, go ahead, Tom. Well, welcome. Um, I've, you know, I've done this, uh, <laughs> done this workshop any number of times in person. It's always fun to look at plants and take them apart and look at petals and sepals and dissect an apple and and by the way, if you if you dissect fruit, make sure to, to uh, not get your sticky fingers all over the keys of your computer. But uh, uh, this is the first time I've tried to do it on Zoom, so it was a bit of a challenge, but I hope, hope it should be fun. Uh, we're gonna, my subtitle is The Secret Life of Plants, because there's an awful lot that goes on in the life of plants that is uh, completely invisible to the average, the average passerby. Um, and that's what we wanna, think about today. Look at some of the obvious things about plants, but also look at some of the things that aren't obvious at all. Um, it's uh, We're going to start off by looking at, uh, at plants in what's called a life cycle. And you think, you think you know what a plant life cycle is because you think that a plant like a daisy, uh, such as this daisy riding the motorcycle, is a uh, is a plant, and a plant makes a seed, and then a seed grows and makes another plant. But that's but that hides a great deal of detail uh, of of what the actual life cycle of a plant is. And that's what we want to look at next. And the most primitive, and when I say primitive, I, I'm talking about from an evolutionary sense. Uh, primitive only means early. It means that from which other things are derived. It doesn't mean imperfect or crude or not very good at all. It simply means first as opposed to what happens afterward. And one of the earliest of the, of the land plants that evolved somewhere over 400 million years ago were mosses. And mosses, uh, at least by later in the summer, often look like this. There's a lot of different mosses, but this is a sort of common looking moss. And you see the sort of green furry part. And then you see these little uh, long uh, linear like things sticking out of the top. And in fact, they're, they're really uh, not the same plant. They're really two plants. Uh, and one is perched right on top of the other. The, the, the green furry thing is the is the, the parent plant and the and the tall skinny thing is the uh, spore bearing offspring of the green furry thing. We want to look and see how that happens because this essential life cycle is what we're going to follow through a number of different plant groups. It's there even in flowers. So here is our uh, our green furry things over here. And we call those gametophytes because what gametophyte, phyte means plant and gameto refers to gametes. So sperm and eggs uh, use the same words we do for sex cells in animals, though they're really um, independently evolved uh, as a part of sexual reproduction. Uh, so the, uh, the gametophyte female organ in the gametophyte called an archegona Archegonia produces an egg, the male organ produces the sperm, and those two from two different uh, green furry uh, mosses then unite. Whenever two sex cells unite, you call it a zygote, whether it's a human being or a moss. That moss then grows into the sporophyte, which is that brown thing that grows out of the end, where the, the archegonia would have been up here and that green spore or the brown sporophyte grows out of the end, it creates this capsule which produces spores. The spores are dispersed, they germinate and grow into another gametophyte. And so you back, go back and forth between gametophyte, sporophyte, gametophyte. And the ends here refer to the genetic constitution of each life cycle. Now, you and I are what's called diploid or 2N, which means we have two copies of information for every trait. And the simplest thing is eye color. I'll, I'll make it even simpler than it actually is. Let's just say there are two, two eye colors, brown and blue. And the blue eyed eye color is recessive, which means that if, you have, if I have one brown eye gene and one blue eye gene, then I would have brown eyes. You wouldn't know that I was carrying the blue eye gene. Uh, whereas the one end condition means I just have one gene. Uh, so when I am sort of equivalent of a sporophyte and when, uh, 
when through meiosis, the dividing of those two into, into, into parts, I directly create sex cells and those sex cells only have one copy. So in my case, I have two blue eye genes and, and all this, the, the sex cells produced uh, by me will carry a blue eye gene. Uh, my father had a blue eye gene and a brown eyed gene. Uh, we actually call them alleles, but, uh, and so if she, if my mother had had, you know, 50 children, uh, she'd laugh if she were alive today. Uh, 20, approximately 25 would have been brown eyed and 25 would have been blue eyed because she was homozygous for blue eyes. And so she would always contribute blue eye gene and about half the, half the kids would have been blue eyed and half brown eyed. So that's what it means to be diploid or have two N. Uh, in the moss's case, the most obvious part of the moss, the green furry part is one N. It only has one copy of genes. And that might seem like just simple bookkeeping, uh, but it's actually um, the whole sexual reproduction ends up being uh, common amongst virtually all um, land plants and animals. And, uh, and so it obviously is important. We can maybe talk a little bit about that later. It's actually one of those great mysteries of biology is the evolution of sexual reproduction, but it's around and it's, and it's basically everywhere you look. So there is our gametophyte, the sporophyte, the brown uh, linear thing with a, with a spore producing capsule at its tip, and that becomes another gametophyte. So there's the basic life cycle of plants. We're gonna see it played out in a number of different kinds of plants. And why do plants do this? You think some, somewhere along, we just would have shortcut this and just, well, an oak tree would produce an acorn and an acorn grows in another oak tree and we, won't, we don't need those gametophytes in there. And believe me, the gametophyte generation is still inside of the oak tree or the lily or any other flowering plant you wanna talk about, even though you don't see it. Why is the alternation of generations there? Well, it's because green algae have an alternation of generations. Uh, and in the case of green algae that live in the water, um, the two generations often look more or less the same. It's just one has two copies of information. One has one. The one copy of information uh, version of the green algae produces gametes, which fuse together, form a zygote, form this copy. And, uh, and you see they turn just like a clock. And then the, through meiosis, the sporophyte produces spores that grow into gametophytes, which produce gametes. And it just goes around and around and around. And, um, You've had millions and millions and millions of these life cycles of green algae, but it was green algae, some version of green algae that eventually uh, moved onto dry land and became a fern. Uh, yes, Dick, it, how, how can that be? How can all of these be ferns? But they are all ferns. Um, and they're all ferns because it's simple alternation of generations. So as green algae moved out, out under dry land, a lot of things had to change and we'll go over that later. But one of the things that didn't change, one of the conserved, well, I use that word many times, conserved structure. It's a structure that uh, is conserved through, through evolutionary time. And so, uh, you know, from, from our earliest, uh, single-celled ancestors, the structure of the eukaryotic cell of the nucleus is a conserved structure all the way up to human beings. We still have that conserved structure of a nucleated cell. Uh, here, the uh, conserved part of the structure, there are many, but we'll just talk in this simple case, is this alternation of generations, the fact that it has to go back and forth between sporophyte and gametophyte. Um, so the... Uh, this is what you think of as a fern, but it's not the only fern. I mean, spores are the dormant phase of the life cycle of a fern. They're every bit as much of a fern, just that little piece of dust. It lands on a moist surface. It grows into this little phallus. The phallus, phallus produces Archegonia and Antheridia, sperm and eggs, those infuse together. Um, form a diploid cell that then grows into a sporophyte, which then produces more spores and the life cycle just turns again and again and again and again. In this case, both gametophyte and sporophyte are visible, though we don't often see these or look for them. 
where ferns are growing, they're, they're there very briefly. Um, these are, are, are what we think of as the fern because they're the large, obvious um, plant. And we're going to look, we're going to take one further step. You know, ferns are evolving around 400 plus million years ago, right around the time. A lot of things happened as, as, uh, as plants moved out onto dry land and, and uh, the first ferns were probably somewhere close to 400 million years ago. Flowering plants are maybe just a little bit more than 100. So there was a quite a bit of time in evolutionary history before the evolution of the flower. But when it happened, um, we end up with this beautiful structure. This is an idealized flower, but it's got all the basic parts. Yes, and flowers play many different parts in our lives today. We give flowers to people we love. They're pretty. But why, why did this How did we get from a green algae, just a sort of squishy green algae, to this, what to our eyes, this beautiful structure called a flower? How did, we, how did that alternation of generations possibly produce this complex, highly differentiated structure? Uh, well, let's start from the outside, just talk about the basic structure of a flower. We have, and we'll go over this in a video here in just a minute, but we have the sepal, on the outside, this is another conserved structure amongst all flowering plants is the basic structure of a flower. The parts go sepal, petal, stamen, pistil, or here called a carpal. Yeah. And carpal really refers to the, uh, the basic structure. All of these are modified leaves. It's easy to see in this case, the sepal is green and it sort of looks leaf-like. And this is sort of leaf shape, the petal, at least when many plants, and but it's a color, and the color is probably there or is there to attract pollinators. But the pistil or carpal and emitter is a folded leaf, and we can see that most easily when we look at the matured uh, carpal of a legume. That pod is a simple, looks like a simple folded leaf, and indeed that's what it is. It's a single folded leaf. In cases where you have multiple leaves that fold, you can, like a lily flower, you have three folded leaves together that form a three carpellate ovary. So that's a, so there's your basic structure, sepal, petal, stamen, and pistil in the middle. And we're gonna talk about two basic divisions of, of, of flowering plants, and those are called monocots and dicots. Uh, we'll talk about the reason for those names here in just a second. But the, the easiest way to tell them apart is, th is the leaves. For one part, the, the leaves of broadleaf plants tend to have net veins or branching veins like the, like the veins of an oak leaf. And the veins of monocots are parallel, not parallel like a, a geometrician might think so, but rather parallel, meaning they start and end in the same point. Uh, they don't branch and form nets or branching veins of a broadleaf plant. And the fact that the flowers in monocots are always in parts of three, often, not always, but often three sepals, three petals, six stamens, and, uh, and a three carpellate over, at least the, in, in many cases, whereas the, whereas the flowers of dicots are in parts of four. And we have differences in vascular structure we'll talk about later. But that the cot part, the dicot part, means two cots or two cotyledons. And the cotyledons are seed leaves. And so when this seed germinated and grew up, the stored food organs inside of the seed uh, were pushed upward and then flopped open onto the first leaves of a plant. These, aren't the, these won't look like the leaves of a mature plant, but they're the first leaves. They're food storage organs that also conduct photosynthesis early in a, in a plant's life, or at least some plants. Sometimes these cotyledons stay below ground as simply food storage. But in other cases, they actually serve as the first leaves of the plant. So two cotyledons. With monocots like corn, the cotyledons, I believe in every case, stay below ground in the seed. And you can see here's the, the uh, cutaway of a, of a corn grain and you can see the cotyledons in there, there's only one of them. So two cotyledons in dicots and one cotyledon in the monocot. And so the first thing above ground with a corn plant 
is a stem with the true leaves of the corn plant. The cotyledon stays below ground. And this, oh, it's not that bad, Calvin. Uh, this does look pretty awful and complicated. This is a life cycle of, of flowering plants are called angiosperms. Uh, and the, here are the life cycle, I mean, this is, I mean, you could say this looks complicated and needlessly complicated, but to me, this is just the wonder of studying botany and studying life science at all is, is seeing these marvelous ways that, that life on earth has, has evolved and turned into these incredibly complicated, beautiful structures. And remember, this is an answer. The, the angiosperm, the flower is an answer to how, to how to make a green algae grow on dry land. It's one of, the, one of the answers to that question. And so you have to get this cycle of life between sporophyte and gametophyte together in ways that allow the two to occur in the same life cycle. And let's just start with a sporophyte, which is what you see, it's the flower in your garden. That's a spore producing plant. You think, no, 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 Tom. Plants make seeds. Well, no, the first thing they do, the plant you're looking at actually makes a spore. And uh, let's look at the male part of the plant first, that the spore is created in the anther of, 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 the, of the stamen. That spore then becomes a pollen grain generally divides once and it goes dormant and becomes a pollen grain. So that pollen grain is now a male gametophyte, right? Remember that word, that's the male gametophyte. And so that will fly through the air and at least some of those pollen grains will land on the stigma, the receptive stigma of a flower. They will germinate and grow down from the stigma to the style into the ovary and discharge the sperm nucleus into, into the ovule, the immature seed that develops inside of the ovary. And the ovary has a female gametophyte called an egg sac that creates the egg inside of the ovule. The egg is then fertilized by the sperm cell. So all this is hidden from view. It's all happening inside of a flower. You just don't know what's happening. And so that once fertilized, that, that, uh, that fertilized egg becomes a zygote, then matures into an embryo, goes dormant inside of the seed so it can be dispersed and then germinates and grows into another sporophyte. So that alternation of generations is still there. We just don't see it. It's just, it's just marvelous to me when you look at plants and you start learning about this, just these marvelous, incredible ways that plants have taken this, this basic structure of the life cycle and, and made it look so entirely different as you move from one plant group to another. You know, give me the fight, and then back to the spore fight. Okay, what I wanted to show you now are just the basic parts of a flower. For some of you who know, know plants uh, well, uh, you already know this, but I, I've been surprised over the years the number of people who actually know some plant ID but have never actually stopped to look at the individual parts of a flower. And it's important. It's important to see what, how flowers are put together because once you learn that, you can use that to help better understand new flowers as, as you learn them. So we start off with this really nice big lily flower. And uh, I always like these in a demonstration like this one because all the parts are so huge. Um, now remember, in a flower we have sepal, petal, starting from the outside, it's sepal, petal, stamen and pistil or carpal in, in the center. So there are those four parts. The first two are sterile. Um, the sepals and petals don't have any direct reproductive function, indirect, but um, so as we start from the outside, the first thing we find in the lily flower are these three parts here, arranged in a whorl around the outside. And so even though those look like petals, those must be sepals. Uh, and the next three that we find that look alike, but they're a slightly different whorl in a slightly um, different position, these are the petals. So, and when we have sepals and petals that look alike, we call often call them tepals. Um, and that's true of a number of monocots. We'll talk about the difference between monocots and dicots. This is a monocot. We had 
Remember, four parts of threes. We have three sepals and three petals. And now let's look at the stamens. The stamens each are, are topped by these large brown anthers. Uh, and there are six of them. So we have three petals, three sepals, six stamens, and then an ovary. Can you look at, can you see the style in the center, how it's three lobed? Everything is in, everything is in threes in the monocot group. So here are our stamens, and the stamen is made up of filament, the long skinny part, and the anther, which is the pollen bearing part. These anthers are very delicately attached. You can move the anthers separate from the tip of the, uh, of the filament. So I'm gonna take off the six stamens. And so we're left with the female part of the flower. Now here, this is the ovary. So this will mature into a capsule in, in, in a lily. Um, there are things in the lily family that have other kinds of fruits, but they all start off with an ovary like this. This is the style, right? Not start, but it's stigma. So here's where pollen from another lily would land, and that pollinate, pollen would germinate. It's a little, uh, remember that pollen is a gametophyte. It germinates and the pollen tube grows all the way down through the style into the ovary and then discharges a sperm nucleus into the one of the little ovules, the immature seeds that will end up inside of the of the capsule. So that's a long way to go. Um, germinates here, pollen tube grows all the way down this style into the ovary that matures into a capsule of little black seeds. So that's that's a uh, a lily. Now notice how. This is where the sepal petals and stamens all attached at the base of the ovary. And so we call that a superior ovary. The ovary is superior or above the point of attachment of sepal petal and stamen. Superior means high, like Lake Superior is the highest of the Great Lakes. Um, so that's, that's the lily. Now let's look at an alstroemeria. These are South American plants. They're also monocots, so parts are in threes. We start from the outside again. Let me look closely. And um, So there's one, two, three. Again, we have tepals here rather than sep separate sepals and petals, but from an evolutionary point of view, this is what the sepals turned into, is things that look like petals. Here are my three petals. Alstroemerias are slightly bilaterally symmetric. You'll notice how one of these petals is a little bit different from the other two. So the lily was, was uh, completely radially symmetric. We call that zygomorphic uh, with, the, uh, with the alstroemeria. Oh, here it is. With the Alstroemeria, it's slightly bilaterally symmetrical, or what's called um, actinomorphic. Now, again, now here is the here is the ovary. Now, I took off the sepals and the petals, and I can take off the stamens. Let's see, one, two, three, four. Five, six again, six stamens. So three sepals, three petals, six stamens. Same same pattern in terms of numbers that we had in the lily. But look, the ovary is below the point of attachment of sepal, petal, and stamen, which came from the top here. So rather than so, this ovary is inferior or below the point of attachment. So this has an inferior ovary. That's not an insult. It's just the, it's a structural fact about alstroemerias is that this is in fact a more advanced plant structure. Um, so this is the inferior ovary. Um, when we look at fruits here in just a minute, we'll see that that difference, uh, there's a difference between an apple and a plum. One that's an inferior, comes from a flower with an inferior ovary and one with a superior ovary. 
And here again is our style and stigma on the Alstrom area, the pollen would land here and the pollen tube would grow down in here and fertilize seeds inside of um, what will become a capsule for the Alstrom area also. And I wanted to show you one plant uh, that just just as a, as a sort of one off, I, this is is not an identification workshop and we could go on and on and on about all the different plant structures but I wanted to show you one of my favorite plant structures and it's the composite it's the composite flower head this you're learning all the things that aren't what you thought they were this is not a flower well you'd always call it a flower a daisy flower but and it is this is a daisy it's a, a cultivar of a of the common oxide daisy we have as a weed pretty weed um, around here, but it's a head of many flowers. Each one of these things that you might think of as petals are separate flowers. And I'm gonna cut the head apart here so that you can see how it's put together. And then I'm gonna take a couple of these now, with a composite head, we have two kinds of flowers. And Jackie will get a close up here in just a minute. But in the center of the flower, even from that distance, you may be able to make up there lots of little things here. Each one of these little yellow things is a separate flower. There are probably several hundred flowers in this head. And around the edge are also flowers, but they're very different flowers. These are called ray flowers. And the ray flower, I'm just going to take a few of these apart. Jackie can get up close to these later and see if she can. I want you, when you get a chance to look at that, what you'll see is that there's a little style and stigma sticking out in the center. It's very tiny because the ovary is very, very tiny. Uh, and these are all little ray flowers. Now they're... Okay, what I wanted to show you now are... Actinomorphic. Now, again... <coughs> in the flower, even from that distance, you may be able to make up there lots of little things here. Each one of these little yellow things is a separate flower. There are probably several hundred flowers in this head. And around the edge are also flowers, but they're very different flowers. These are called ray flowers. And the ray flower, I'm just going to take a few of these Jackie can get up close to these later and see if she can. I want you, when you get a chance to look at that, what you'll see is that there's a little style and stigma sticking out in the center. It's very tiny because the ovary is very, very tiny. Uh, and these are all little ray flowers. Now they will have pretty little um, five branched uh, corolla where all the petals are fused together and then there's little five branches at the tip. Remember, this is a dicot. It is a broadleaf plant. Was a mistake. There should have been disc flowers. The little ones are disc flowers. Of a, of a lily. This is the broadleaf, the branching leaf of a broadleaf plant. And so we expect the flower parts to be in fours and fives, and indeed they are with, uh, with the daisy. So that's just a very, very brief introduction. Just a few, just the, the plant world is so amazing and beautiful, and this is just a teeny tiny little introduction to that. Just some of the beautiful things you see when you, when you, when you look closely at a flower. One of the funny things when you look at at uh, at plants uh, when you 
when you start asking questions about why plants look the way they do, look at a goldenrod. A goldenrod is a composite. If you look really, really closely at this massive yellow, you see that it's actually a lot of little composite heads, just like the daisy we looked at. We call that an involucre, this, this, this group of green modified leaves that hold a group of, uh, of little flowers together here. There are both uh, disc flowers and ray flowers as a part of this head, but they're so small, you don't really appreciate the individual one. You have to wonder why, why would a plant do this? Why would it, why would it miniaturize? Why would it create the composite head and then miniaturize it and create hundreds to thousands of them on, on one plant? Why, why would it do that? Um, and, uh, you know, let's, let's just think about that for a moment. I, I, love, I love these sort of thought, thought things, uh, just, just trying to understand why flowers do what they do if we, if we think about, about the um, evolution of the composite group, we have the evolution of the flower, you know, somewhere over hundred million years ago, you create these little um, five part flowers, uh, little individual composite flowers, they group together into a head. Uh, and that head mimics a simple flower. A daisy sort of mimics a simple flower, doesn't it? The ray flowers sort of look like petals as if they're not giving insects much credit for smarts. And so they, the insect sees this signal that looks like a simple flower with these big showy ray flowers along the head, around, around the edge of the head and it draws the insect in. And, and from there, Composites kind of go, they go in many directions. Well, you can think of going in two directions. Sometimes they make the head very large, like, uh, like a sunflower, particularly domestic fun sunflower. You get a head, a large head with lots and lots of rays and discs, and therefore the possibility of making many seeds. Uh, or you create uh, something like a goldenrod. There's very tiny heads, but you multiply the number of heads. And so we we can, uh, those two basic strategies. Um, but composites do, do even more than that. It's one of the reasons I love the composite family. So you take that basic daisy flower head and you get rid of the disc flowers and all you have are rays and that's what you have in a dandelion. They're all ray flowers. Or you could do the opposite and you can have a composite head that's all disc flowers and you lost all of the ray flowers like a blazing star or the cockle burr. We don't, I mean, mostly we know the cockle burr by pulling the burrs out of our dog's hair, but a cockle burr is a composite. Those burrs were composite uh, flower heads. And here you see it early in its life. Uh, the, the involucre, that group of little green leaves, here the green leaves are modified into spines that are hooked on the end that will end up catching on the hair of passing mammals. And so we have all of those bizarre forms and structures that have evolved within a single family of plants. But the most, the most, the neatest one, the one that causes me the most problems every year is ragweed, which is a composite. And this up close and personal is the male ragweed flower head. Now ragweed is a very highly evolved composite, it's probably the most advanced composite in our, in our flora. Uh, it has separated the function of male and female flower heads. These are the male heads and they're arranged in those familiar spikes on uh, when they come, uh, when they ripen there in mid-August and, the, and the, the yellow puffs of smoke start coming off as you walk past is when my sinuses back up and I have to start taking the de decongestant tablets for a few weeks to, uh, to make it through. But doesn't now you can see that that looks like a little composite flower head. There are the involucral bracts surrounding the head. Each one of these little flowers is really just a mass of anthers that will, that will produce masses of pollen. If we look lower on the plant, we can find the female flower heads uh, that will eventually mature into these little, the whole head then matures into a little, a key, almost a little capsule-like structure. I'm not quite sure what you, Call that um, perhaps that I think I think in this case the female flower head is a single flower and that is simply the akein of that single flower. But this is marvelously differentiated, all from the same ancestral uh, composite line. 
And it's all about making more. I mean, with plants, I mean, with animals, we can think of animals that make lots of, you know, lot, have lots of babies, you know. A possum is, as a mammal has lots of babies, only a few of which survive. Um, human beings are on the other end and we tend to have relatively few offspring and most of those survive to adulthood. With plants, they're, they're, in, a, they're in a situation where they're all producing masses of offspring. Um, and, uh, and because only one in many thousands, sometimes one in many million of those seeds will ever germinate and grow into a mature plant and produce more seeds of its own. And so flowers can't afford to, be, to invest an awful lot in any one seed. They have to produce many of them. And so you have to take every visit of a pollinator and, and turn it into lots of seeds. And so an orchid is sort of the type of example of that. It looks, it's beautiful flowers, but, uh, but each time an orchid is pollinated, uh, the, the, the insect is carrying whole sacks of pollen that come from another orchid flower called pollenia. And that's, those, uh, those fertilize millions of, of ovules inside of the ovary of the orchid flower, which produces uh, sometimes over a million dust-like seeds from one act of pollination. With a strawberry, so you create a pod full of dust-like seeds. With a strawberry, uh, each of these little uh, things here is a seed. It's actually a matured ovary. There are many ovaries in the strawberry. We'll dissect one a little bit later in the presentation. So from one pollinator visit, you can potentially pollinate, fertilize all, all the seeds in all of these different little ovaries and produce many potential offspring. With a sunflower, uh, you have, this is the composite seed head again. And so you have many seeds, one insect lands a composite head and crawls around for a while looking for nectar and they can pollinate uh, many, many, many of the individual flowers and produce many seeds. And with a golden rod, you have many seed heads. Again, insects land, they start crawling around for up and down those clusters of flower heads and uh, pollinate many seeds. And so there are all ways of efficiently using every single pollinator visit. And you start to think about this, you realize in the evolution of flowers that it's, a, it's, a, it's what we call a mutualistic symbiosis. Both the insects and the flowers get something out of it, but flowers in particular uh, are, are trying to make absolutely most efficient use of every pollinator visit to produce the maximum number of seeds. And when we look at diversity in the plant world, um, what we're going to see is that, uh, well, 12,000 seems like a large number, um, as do 10,000 ferns. Now, interesting with ferns and mosses, the same ferns and mosses, not all the same, but many of the same ferns and mosses you'll find here in the United States. And when you go to the U UK, um, where I've been many times, my wife is, is from England, so we traveled over there many times. And I was surprised, though I kind of knew I was supposed to expect it, I was surprised to find many of the same fern species growing there that I was familiar with in the Eastern United States. Uh, and that's because the, the, the agent of dispersal is a spore, which can actually get into the upper, upper atmosphere and blow across, across oceans. Um, with gymnosperms, uh, which are, are uh, mostly conifers, you know, pines and spruces and, and uh, larches, but also include ginkgos and their allies. Um, uh, a thousand, not all that many. With conifers, there's only 600, even though conifers are very successful in some ways, they cover much of the northern forest and are actually common all throughout the tropics and other parts of the world. There really aren't very many species of them. Uh, whereas with flowering plants, there are 300,000. Uh, so this was Darwin's abominable mystery of, of why, why are there so many flowering plants? And you could phrase this question, maybe this is the wrong question. I think it's the question Darwin asked and many people have asked since is what's so much better about flowering plants? Maybe it's not something so much better, it's just that flowering plants have a knack for making more species of flowering plants. Let's just think about that for a minute, the speciation. So we have, what, what do you have to do to create another species? Well, with plants, you have to have reproductive isolation. So a group of plants has to be reproductively isolated. So they begin to evolve into something other 
than what they were beforehand. And insect pollination may actually make that a lot easier because of simple the change of the color of the petals might, might reproductively isolate a, a, a plant or a small group of plants from one another from its parent group that maybe had white petals and the, and the offspring are having red petals. And so it might be that they're pollinated mostly by other species. And so you can see those two groups may start to evolve separately. Um, maybe the length of the life cycle. Any, anytime you speed up the life cycle, you make it possible for evolution to move faster. Fruit flies evolve faster than mammals and bacteria evolve faster than fruit, fruit flies. And uh, bacteria evolve even faster than, uh, or yeah, bacteria evolve even faster than, than fruit flies. And the smaller an organism is, the, the bigger the population can be. And the bigger the population, the more chance that any one of those organisms might carry a single favorable new mutation. And the extreme of that are, you have 380 trillion viruses living in your body right now. It's kind of creepy to think about that. The COVID problem, uh, put to one side, you've already got three, 380 trillion viruses living on or in your body right now that are completely harmless and they even, in fact, help you. Um, but because they're so tiny, you can fit a lot of them in there so that it's the possibility of any one of them having a favorable mut mutation that then propagates. And limited dispersal, you wouldn't think about a limitation as being a good thing, but one of the reasons that there are so many flowering plants is that the flowering plants in Europe and North America are almost entirely different because seeds can't make it across an ocean. And when you isolate the two groups of plants, you get the potential for a European beech to diverge slightly from an American beech, from European, the English oak to diverge from what we have as a white oak in this country. They look eerily similar in many ways, and yet they're different because they've been isolated and seeds can't make it across the ocean. So there, there are, are a number of sort of candidates of why there are so many flowering plants. None of these are completely convincing, but there are a lot of candidates. So let's go back to the beginning. This is the actual way Noah's flood happened. They weren't animals in the ark, they were plants because everyone knows you'd have to have plants before you can have animals. And so when you get, let's go back to kind of the original colonization of the, uh, of dry land. And we, and I said that green algae, all plants descend from green algae and yet there's green algae on the left and, and a beautiful Michigan lily on the right. Well, they don't look very similar, do they? Same life cycle is conserved in the two of them. And we know the green algae is the ancestor because photosynthesis, photosynthesis occurs exactly the same in green algae as it does in the flowering plant. And other algae use different kinds of chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pathways. And so we're pretty sure that the green algae is the ancestor, one kind of green algae of over 400 million years ago was the ancestor of the first land plants. Um, and uh, yes, uh, it must have been very difficult moving out onto dry land because it's such a different environment. Just, just think about the difference between these two. The life cycle of an algae, remember, as a sporophyte and gametophyte, is the, the gametophyte produces little gametes that then swim through the water because they're in the water and they can swim uh, and they can swim the one kind of gametophyte, arbitrarily call it male, finds the other kind of gametophyte female, they fuse together, form an embryo that grows into the spore producing uh, algae that probably looks very similar, produces a spore. The spore are, are flagellated so they can swim where they wanna go and they, they can germinate and grow. And so all of that life cycle stuff seems pretty more, much more straightforward in the ocean. When you move out into the dry land, it's a lot harder. You, you, you can't move an algae onto dry land. It just dries up and dies and couldn't reproduce because those flagellated, um, uh, we'll just call them sperm and eggs and spores, wouldn't have anywhere to move. Uh, and yet, when you move out onto dry land, you create all kinds of problems, like, like the leaf. You take a mass of, of green algae and it just 
dries up within a few minutes and dies. And so the leaf has to be a very specialized structure. It has an epidermis on both edges. It has to control water loss. It has a cuticle of wax that helps to control the water loss exuded by the epidermis. Inside of it is the business part, the palisade layers and mesophyll that <coughs> where the photosynthesis takes place. But to, but to conduct photosynthesis, you have to bring carbon dioxide into the leaf. You just seal the leaf off on both sides. And so how do you get air or carbon dioxide into the leaf? Well, you have to have little breathing structures called stomates that allow the gas to come in and carbon dioxide to enter the cell. And so you create this enormous problem and you evolve a structure to solve it. I've sort of left the mosses out of this, but have shown some intermediate between algae and flowering plants. But this is a beautifully specialized structure that's evolved to take what are basically algae cells here in the middle and get them to live on dry land. Or the vascular system, once you have those leaves dangling up there in the atmosphere, they have to lose some water because they have to open themselves up to gases. And so water vapor escapes and you have to bring water up from below. And so you have to have a vascular system. And with most broadleaf plants, it's arranged in a little uh, siphon-like arrangement. And in it, you have what are called both xylem and phloem. And the xylem is what brings the water upward from the roots in the ground up to the leaves. That's obviously important because the leaves need to transpire water and take in carbon dioxide. And you have to have phloem because the leaves are making sugars that have to, that have to get down to the roots to keep them alive. And the phloem tissue is specialized to move sugar solutions downward. And so we have this evolution of a leaf, we have the evolution of a vascular system to move fluids back and forth in the plant, but why does it end up looking like this? And this is, you see you grew up in a world, we become uh, familiar with a world before we can ever talk, we look at the world around us and we move around in it in our early years and people eventually tell us to use the word plant and tree and weed for these funny looking things that we see. And they become so familiar, we never ask a question about it again, but why does the plant look like this? It's kind of weird looking structure. I mean, you have two eyes and two ears and uh, one mouth and two arms and legs. And, uh, so, but look at this, just the multiplication of all of these different parts in a plant with no regular symmetrical arrangement. Why are we so different? And when we look at, at uh, the structure of a plant, we realize it's, it's the way a plant solves that problem. Remember, these are basically algae that have figured a way to grow on dry land. And so they create this branch root system that has a huge surface area of contact with the, with the moist soil in which water enters. This tremendously branched above ground part with all these little leaves that have a tremendous surface area of contact from the atmosphere. And so water evaporates from the leaves as it evaporates from the leaves, water, which is a polar molecule, the molecules pull on one another, and that pulls water upward from the roots through the stem, out into the leaves, goes out into the atmosphere, eventually falls as rainfall, and we have this water cycle, all completely powered by the sun. So plants may not look smart, but you and I have to work for a living and have to expend energy, whereas a plant, once it creates its structure, is fed water and nutrients, come out of the soil, completely solar powered, system. Now we're going to talk a little bit about growth. Show you here is just the, the way that woody plants grow in extension. Um, this, this from where my left hand is here, all the way out here, is a, is a shoot that grow, grew in the uh, summer of 2020. That's one year of growth, which means if we've been here in the spring of 2020, this central twig would have ended here, and this would have simply been a bud here. That bud broke dormancy, and that's 2020. Here's another 2020 shoot, another 2020 shoot, another one, another one, another one. And typically, the shoot doesn't branch in, in the year that it grows out. Now, there are some, there are certain species of plants that can flush twice, and you can get some branching in the same year the shoot goes out. But typically, the shoot grows out, uh, it stops growth, and then these buds along the side, any of these buds, 
had I not cut it off, could have broken dormancy and created another shoot coming out this way. All right, so that's how woody plants go just by addition. So if this is 2020, the big stick here is 2019. That's how fast these mulberries grow. This would have been, this would have looked like this in the, uh, in the summer of 2019. So that's a, a mulberry alternating. You can see the alternating bud here, bud there, bud there, bud there, bud there, bud there, back and forth and back and forth. Here is the same thing happening in the dogwood uh, with opposite branching. But again, if we go out here to the tip, this is, this is the growth of 2020. Uh, there are buds, they're opposite one another. There are tiny little buds on either side of the twig right here. Had I not cut it off, those buds could have broken dormancy and created another two twigs coming out there in there in 2021. So this is 2020, which makes this stem all the way back to here, 2019. So that's, that's how woody plants grow in extension. You just add these, you can think of it I mean, the, 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 the popular building toys today are, um, are Legos. When I was a kid, they were tinker toys, with little wooden sticks and balls, and you just put them together, boom, 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 one after the other. And that's the way a woody plant is put together, just by a set of shoots, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And remember, they grow in girth, they grow in watt, they get bigger this way by growth in the vascular cambium, adding more and more layers of wood. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about that growth. Here we, this is that familiar, we all know about this, none of those things we're so familiar with, we hardly ever even ask how it, how it happened. This is, a, this is a, you know, a um, cross section of a, of a woody plant. We could count the number of rings in the temperate areas of the world. We have a distinct growing season. You get one ring. This typically, uh, this lighter colored wood is the spring wood that grows out as, a, as the plant is growing rapidly in the spring and then it slows down at the end of the summer and creates a darker band. Uh, that th In this case, it would be very easy to count the rings because of the contrasting colors in something like a sugar maple, those contrasts are much more subtle and it takes a lot of pains with a microscope have done this in the past doing ring counts on trees uh, to see those growth rings, but they're there. And because of the annual, cycle of rapid growth and then dormancy over winter, you get distinct growth rings in the tropics. Humid tropics where growth conditions are good year round, you don't get rings in trees because it requires dormancy to produce the ring. And so you have a, a sort of homogeneous wood uh, wherever you, or if you have a distinct dry season, that may be what slows the growth down and creates a growth ring. But when we look at, at this, uh, we can see that there's outer bark in a woody stem like this. There's the, the, the phloem, which is the, the inner, often called inner bark. It's not really a bark, but it's a inner bark that carries the sugar solutions downward to the roots. And then the whole center of the wood is xylem tissue. That's the tissue that at least initially was carrying water. Now, typically as wood gets very old, it becomes non-functional for water transport. Uh, the extreme of that would be oaks where the, where the wood is really only functional for the season in which it is created. And after that, it's non-functional for water transport, simply there for support. So that's, that's how woody plants grow in girth. And we can see here the, the basic vascular system. I talked about that before, when we look at a, at a broadleaf plant, the vascular bundles are arranged in a, in a, in a, in a in a siphon tube-like arrangement, which leaves an opening in the middle, and we call that the pith, or that becomes the pith. It's kind of what's left behind when you arrange the uh, the vascular bundles in a in in a uh, in a siphon-like arrangement, and the boundary between uh, cambium and phloem is what's called the the boundary between xylem and phloem is what we call the vascular cambium. That's the generative tissue that will eventually start to produce layers of xylem on the inside and layers of phloem on the outside and create that familiar bullseye pattern of a growing woody plant. All woody plants in that first little shoot that comes out in the springtime of an oak tree 
will look like this. And only by later in that year has it un begun to, to, uh, to produce secondary growth in this, this bullseye pattern. Just, just how, do, how do plants do it? This is the fascinating thing about studying plants, trying to figure out how they go about growing and, and occupying the dry land parts of the earth. And here we're looking just a little, little quickly, quickly at, at the difference in vascular structures between dicots and monocots. And here is the dicot, that familiar um, uh, tube-like or siphon-like arrangement of the vascular bundles, leaving a pith or an area of, of spongy cells in the center. Uh, with monocots, it's very different. The vascular bundles are just scattered throughout the plant. You know, if you, if you frequent farms, I have close friends who run a farm and so I'm around the farm often enough, particularly in the fall. And you look at a broken off corn plant, you see it's sort of spongy in the middle, but it's full of fibers poking out of it. And those fibers are the vascular bundles and they're scattered all throughout the plant. So very different arrangement of vascular tissue. Uh, just a little bit of fancy, you know, fancy words are always useful when you can toss them out at meal time when you're talking about things and you can talk about the, the uh, this is the primitive uh, protosteel arrangement of vascular plants. Originally, the first vascular plants had this protosteelic arrangement with, a, with just a little bundle right in the center. And only later did they develop this siphon-like arrangement. We used to, back in the day when I learned it, these were both called siphonosteels, but here you can see that continuous vascular tissue here is arranged into bundles um, in a siphon-like arrangement. And, but in fact, today, the protosteel is still with us. In fact, it's, it's all around us. The, the root system of plants is a protosteel arrangement. So in the center of a root is a bundle of vascular tissue. It's not a pith. So even in a small root, if you cut it open and look for the pith, it wouldn't be there. There is no pith in a root. The above ground parts of a woody plant or, or a, or a non-woody plant have either an opening in the center or spongy material that, that's the pith uh, where the root retains this uh, protostelic arrangement. You say, well, that's kind of interesting, but maybe not all that interesting arrangement, but, it, but it's the reason why plants have a distinct Boundary between root and shoot, it's called the root collar. It's where these two different vascular systems knit together. And in the early, in the early herbaceous plant, there are two very different vascular systems that have to knit together, which is why when you plant plants, you don't wanna bury the upper part of the plant below the soil. That's a specialized part of the plant that was meant to be in the air. Whereas the root system is a different arrangement of vascular tissue that was meant to, to be below ground. Now let's talk a little bit about fruits. I should have played this as a game to see if you could get the punchline to each joke, or maybe I should have brought my harmonica. We need a little music. What I want to do now is to look at some of the common fruits. Hey, Tom, we had a question before we okay. started the video. Sure. What happens to above ground parts of the plant when they do end up buried in soil? Well, I mean, some, some plants will... Uh, We'll survive that. I mean, I, I, you know, I've, I've done a lot more work with the trees. So, I mean, if you bury an oak tree, if you bury the stem below ground, it's it's going to end up rotting the bark, and you'll end up with a sick tree that won't won't live very long. Um, so, you want to make sure you get the root collar uh, right at the at the soil surface. Uh, a plant like a cottonwood tree is much more tolerant of that uh, and can survive burial. I've seen cottonwoods that are buried tens of feet below the sand. It's dry sand, but uh, they just continue to grow out the top of the dunes. There's a lot of, a lot of variation on that, but when in doubt in planting trees, put the root collar right at the ground level. Be careful when you're planting it. Don't bury it and don't leave, don't leave the roots exposed at the, at the surface. People usually don't leave the roots exposed, but they often 
bury the thing deep in the ground thinking it's a tomato. With some plants, they'll actually create adventitious roots from the, from the stem part of the plant. But with most, uh, if you're, you're, you're uh, always safest if you don't know is to, is to keep the root collar at the ground level. So there, there is some variation on that, but with, in particular with trees and people often find themselves planting trees or many people plant trees, just really need to be careful about getting the root collar right at the ground level. Cool. Uh, one other thing, wanted to check um, if the sound on this video is all the way turned up. I know folks were having a little bit harder of a time hearing, so I encourage them to okay. put in their headphones. Uh, but you can uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop, see. Stop, share, and just check. If I, that... I check, I turned it up a little. Um, I think that's about the max I can do. I can stop sharing and check the, the, the sound on the. No, that's, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry about that. There's so, there's so many bells and whistles on a computer. All right, we're doing our best to make sure you guys got the best sound possible. But now, now I've got the sound so loud it's deafening. But um, all right, okay. Did you uh, check the boxes when you reshared your screen? I, I didn't, but I think they'll stay. Their screen, yeah, they're still checked. Well, all right. Okay. Um. What I want to do now is to look at some of the common fruits you probably have around your kitchen. If not right now, you probably have them around your kitchen in the last year, things that people commonly eat. Um, and I'm going to talk about them as parts of the flower. Uh, we probably don't think about them that way. I do all the time. But most of you just eat, eat stuff uh, and don't stop to think about where it comes from necessarily. And all of these are the matured ovary of a flower. This is uh, the alstroemeria we were looking at earlier when we were talking about flowers. And uh, of course, you know where the ovary is. If we, uh, you know, these are petals, and so petals and sepals, we get rid of those. And uh, there's stamens around that. And then in the center, there was, remember, there was a, a pistil, um, or sometimes called carpels, but. Um, and there is the, there's the style and the stigma on the end, this receptive part. And so when the uh, pollen grain lands on the stigma, the, it, it, remember the pollen grain is an independent little living thing. It germinates and starts to grow. And the pollen tube grows all the way down this style and into the ovary. And then it finds the uh, ovules, which are immature seeds, unfertilized seeds. Uh, discharges a sperm nucleus, and that really completes the, the syngamy, that creation of, of the next uh, um, plant, the next sporophyte, if you remember that word from earlier in the presentation. Um, but then that, that little zygote, which then becomes an embryo, has to be inside of something, and, and, it, and it ends up inside of a seed. And, uh, and that seed is enclosed in a fruit. And the fruit, in every case, is the matured ovary. This little green bulb you see at the tip of my fingers is the ovary of the alstroemeria. That, this one will happen to turn into a capsule and not a fleshy fruit you would eat. But that's the, that's the ovary of the flower. So each one of these is a matured ovary of a flower. Sometimes it's a little bit more than just the ovary, but it's the ovary. Um, of a flower. And we're going to start off by looking at some berries and probably things you never really thought of as berries. Some of the things you call berries aren't berries at all. And then some of the things you don't think of as berries like tomatoes are actually berries. This is, uh, you know, the little cherry tomatoes you buy in the store. Um, we can uh, take those apart and you can see that I don't know if Jack can get up and, and show that. You can see that there is a one, one uh, it's divided in half there. So that's two carpels, two folded leaves that made, made up the ovary is in an evolutionary sense. Uh, we end up, this is the simple tomato. In fact, if you looked at a nightshade berry or at a, um, um, 
that other uh, berry fruited like well potatoes end up having little berries as fruits. And if you look at the primitive structure of the, in the family, the Solanaceae, of these uh, berries, a berry is a, is a soft fruit with many, with many seeds. This is a larger tomato. Um, many of the hybrids and tomatoes that have been in cultivation for a very long time are divided into many parts. These are Mexican tomatoes that actually taste quite good even when they're out of season. And uh, you can see there are three divisions in this one. So it really means that it's been in cultivation long enough that they have developed larger, more complex fruits. So there is a berry you probably didn't think of as a berry because it's not especially sweet, though tomatoes have quite a bit of sugar in them. Uh, but a, a berry is a soft, fleshy fruit of matured over that's soft and fleshy and has many, many small seeds. Uh, another berry you didn't think of as a berry is an orange or, or it could be a lime or it could be a lemon. Uh, if you remember that definition, then it's not hard to believe this is a berry because it's a soft fruit. And uh, while this is, happens to be a seedless one, if, you're, if you've had seeded orange, you would find uh, many small seeds uh, in the interior of the orange, generally near the center. But it's a soft, fleshy fruit with many seeds. This one, with uh, with these members of the uh, citrus family, they're divided into partitions by these uh, uh, yeah, these, these partitions in the fruit. And so you call this a special kind of berry. It's called a Hesperidium. There's a 25 cent word you can amaze your family and friends with the next time you eat an orange, you could say, pass me the Hesperidium. Uh, nice, nice, beautiful, big, fancy word. And it's a special kind of berry and a soft fleshy fruit with many small seeds. And uh, likewise, you probably never thought of banana as a berry. Uh, in fact, the bananas you eat are seedless. And so we don't see the seeds in the banana. Um, but what we do uh, see is, uh, is this is a, a banana is a, is a monocot. Remember we talked about the difference between monocots and dicots. So that you expect the flower parts to be in threes with, uh, with a monocot, right? Uh, and we, we looked at flowers and we looked at, remember we looked at superior and inferior ovaries. Well, this is where the banana um, attached here to the, to the plant. So this was the base of the flower. And you can see here, this is the point where, it, where it's sort of cut off here. This is where, where the, where the um, sepals and petals of the flower would have been attached to the ovary here at the tip. So that makes it right. Remember, the uh, ovary is under the point of attachment of sepals and petals. It's an inferior ovary so that uh, the sepals and petals become a part of, of this structure we call the hypanthium that reaches down around the ovary from top to bottom. We just think of that as the peel of a banana, but this is, this is the hypanthium. This is the fusion of sepals, petals, and stamens that, that goes around the ovary and then all those parts branch off on top. And we can still find the old filaments of the stamens on the inside. When you, when you eat a banana, you find these, these little things here. This is what's left of the staminal filaments, and so that's the long skinny part of the stamen. Uh, it's left running along the inside of the hypanthium tube. Uh, you can eat them up, or if you're like me and you have to pick at things that you eat, you can pull them off. Uh, and uh, remember, this is a uh, Hey, Tom, since you're forwarding past this part, we have a question in the chat. Um, if there are no seeds in an orange, is it still a berry? And I muted you just for the video, so there is no background noise, so you'll have to unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, um, so, uh, well, that that sort of technical difference you can you can uh, you can take the seeds out of the fruit but you can't really change the kind of fruit it is it's a berry fruit that uh, 
or the seeds uh, simply never develop. So you'd still call it a berry, but um, um, I mean, uh, one, of the, one of the fun things in looking at fruits is so, so widely varied uh, fruits and plants there's so many different structures is to try to take them apart and try to figure out what part of the flower or accessory part of the flower you're actually eating. And in the case of the berry, it's a mature to ovary that at least uh, it's, it's wild ancestor there were that had many small seeds. Cool. Okay. All right. And I'm gonna have you unmute when the video is going just to limit background noise again. So if you have a okay. comment, just remember to unmute. <laughs> okay. Three. It's a and the, the parts in threes there. This banana wasn't quite ripe enough. Once they're ripe, you can separate it into three three segments, 120 degrees of the circle of each one. Tastes pretty good. Maybe another day, another day it would have been super ripe. Okay, so those were berries, soft fruits with many small seeds. Now banana, sometimes you can see just tiny little black dots in there. That's the remnant of what the seeds would have been. The bananas you eat are, are hybrids and they were hybridized, the two parents, one parent had, was diploid, in other words, if you remember when I was talking about diploid and haploid earlier. Now diploid means it's like you and me, we have two copies of genes, I have two blue-eyed genes. Uh, um, so I have two genes for each character. Uh, but had I undergone what's called polyploidy, I might have four genes for every character. Uh, and so in the creation of the domestic banana, they hybridized two bananas, one diploid and one tetraploid, with four copies, and they ended up with a sterile hybrid with three copies. And it's sterile because in meiosis, when you create sex cells, you have to divide the genes you have in half, and you can't divide three in half evenly. And so your a triploid hybrid is always sterile. This is a sterile triploid hybrid, nice fruit to eat. It doesn't make any fertile seeds, so they're always reproduced vegetatively. So those are berries. Now let's look at some droops. Depending on what kind of droop it is, like a, a cherry, um, um, yeah, a choke cherry, a black cherry, uh, the cherries you buy in the store, you might think of them as sort of berry-like, but inside of a droop is, is a single seed. This is an avocado. This is in the, the laurel family. Uh, members, the nearest member we have of that here would be sassafras that grows abundantly in the dunes around the southern tip of Lake Michigan. I'm not sure it gets much closer than that. And as you go south in the southeastern United States, we have Red Bay and some other beautiful members of the laurel family. But this is the avocado. And so the, this is a matured ovary again. Uh, and so, and this is the, seed, but the seed is inside of a pit, meaning that, all right, I'm going to use three different words here when I'm talking about the ovary. Uh, botanist divided into three parts. The outside we call the exocarp. Carp is, means a pit is just ovary. Ovary is a matured carp or, or a leaf. So exocarp. The mesocarp is the soft part of this that you eat. I uh, love it with a little Tabasco on it, some salt, great stuff. Um, and then the endocarp is what surrounds the pit. Uh, and we'll look at the plum next, and the, and the plum has a very hard endocarp, super hard, or like a cherry pit. I mean, you can't, you don't want to bite into that very hard, it'll hurt your teeth. The uh, avocado pit is a lot softer, and you can break it open. The, uh, the endocarp is very thin, and it's fused with a seed coat. Here it's really hard to tell the two apart. Uh, this is the endosperm of the, uh, the flower, the stored food that the seed will use as it's, uh, as it's growing. Um, and if you look really closely, that little bit right there is a part of the embryo of the next generation of avocado, the tiny little embryonic uh, plant inside of the seed. So that, that is surrounded by the endosperm, which is the, was a part of the 
flower that's created as the as the seed matures. It's surrounded by the endocarp of the ovary, the mesocarp of the ovary, that soft part that you leave in, and the exocarp, the tough leathery part that protects all of that uh, when it's uh, put it back together again. All right, we're going to look at another droop. This is uh, peaches, plums, and cherries are all in the same genus. The genus is Prunus. Uh, and they're all, and they all have uh, pits. Uh, and there's the pit, very hard pit. Um, so the endocarp here is hard and bony and it surrounds the seed. Um, so the, uh, um, oh, trying to think of the nut. Um, coming to mind right now. Um, but anyway, We've got the, the soft fleshy part, the endocarp, the exocarp, the skin of the plum, the, uh, the exocarp, the, the mesocarp, and then the endocarp, the hard bony part surrounding the seed. Now, put your look at the cross section of the, of the plum, and you see that um, this was the point of attachment of the, where, where, where the flower of attachment of the flower right there. So this is the matured ovary of the of the uh, flower. The sepals and petals were attached at the base and we know that because if the tip here is all smooth. There's no point of attachment for any old flower parts at the tip of the plum. They were all attached here at the base. Um, and we'll see something slightly different when we look at the apple here. And the apple is a different kind of fruit. Uh, remember the, the the, uh, the avocado and the plum were both droops, a single seed with a hard, generally a hard bony cover, and the avocado is really not, not very bony. Uh, and this is a poem, and a poem is a product of, a, of an inferior ovary. Let me cut this open and we can see what I mean by that. So that here is, here is a, I'll just stick the knife in. That's where the, the apple would have been attached, or the flower would have been attached to the tree. And this is this is the um, well, the ovary. Let me put this right. Uh, so all the parts were attached here, and so we have sepal sepals and petals and stamens were all attached here and reached around the ovary. And you can see the remnants of the sepals right here. So there's the remnants of the sepals of the flower at the tip of the fruit. With the plum, it would have been back here, but with the apple, it's an inferior ovary, so the sepal petals and stamens are attached at the top of the ovary, so it ends up being here at the end of the fruit. And when we look at an apple, the ovary is pretty easy to see. We call it the core. That's the ovary of the apple flower. Right there. And so what is this? Well, remember I, I said how all flowers, flowers are a conserved structure, so all flowers are put together the same. Start on the outside, sepal, petal, stamen, pistil. Sepal, petal, stamen, pistil. So this is the pistil or carpal or ovary of the flower in the center. And so surrounding that, we have to have stamens and petals and sepals, right? That's and those all came from here. So, so the stamen, sepal, and petal are a part of this hypanthium that reaches just like the banana peel. This is like the banana peel, only in this case, this is the part that you eat that you like so much. Sepal, petal, and stamen are fused in the hypanthium, and that surrounds the ovary, the pit. So the pit has a slightly sort of papery, I mean, you can actually eat the pit and just split the seeds out. Most people don't like the texture of the pit but the soft fleshy part is the, is the matured hypanthium. This is the ovary on the inside. So similar texture of the fruit is kind of similar to the, to the plum, but really a different origin. This is really not a, not a part of the ovary at all. This is the hypanthium that's swelled up and become fleshy and sweet. And we all know why all these Fruits are, I mean, they're, or their wild progenitors are fleshy and sweet, right? That's because they wanted animals to eat them. Um, 
it's a means of dispersal. It's one of the it's one of the key things that the ovary does. The ovary of the flower protects the seed. It creates a vessel in which um, pollination takes place. The actual fertilization of the seed takes place inside of this vessel. But then and then the seeds form inside the ovary, so it gives it protection. And then it also, in many cases, aids in the dispersal of the seed. It's a critical part of the life cycle of plants is getting those seeds away from the parent plant dispersed into the world around it. So we've looked at two different groups. Now we're gonna look at some very common looking fruits that you're used to eating, but you didn't think of them. You probably, we call these berries, a raspberry and a black berry, but they're actually not berries. They're, they're, they're this comes from a, a flower and uh, we'll show you that flower if it's not in the inset image in this, in the, while, while I'm talking here on the video, I'll show it to you when I'm finished. And so the flower has many, many little ovaries and each one of the ovaries of the flower creates another little bump on the surface of this raspberry or blackberry. And each one of those is a tiny droop, just like a plum or a cherry. Only there are many of them because there were many, many little ovaries of the blackberry or raspberry flower. And so we call this an aggregate of groups, an aggregate, yeah, an aggregate of droops. Uh, and the difference, you know, the difference between blackberries and raspberries, we have both of them growing in the park here, the wild progenitors of these. When you look at, at the two of them, you can see that the, uh, the raspberry is hollow on the inside because the receptacle of the flower to which all of those little ovaries were attached The receptacle of the flower, uh, in the case of the blackberry, is fleshy and you just eat it. So as the fruit of the blackberry matures, that receptacle becomes fleshy and you just, and it's full of sugar and you just eat it. You never know, it doesn't taste woody or anything. Whereas the raspberry, the receptacle remains hard and, and lignified and, it, and the berries, the aggregate of, of droops just pops off as a little cup. So an aggregate of droops, many, many little droops all put together. And the flower is the best part of doing the basic botany workshop. Jackie just has to watch. And the last thing I wanted to show you is an abstract. This is another thing you call the berry, right? The strawberry, but it's not a berry. Um, in fact, the part you're looking at here, almost everything you eat when you eat this is the receptacle of the flower. And what the receptacle is, is that with many flowers, it's sort of a little woody button. And to that button attaches the ovary, the, the, the stamens, the petals, the sepals. Um, it's just, just a functional piece for, as the base for the flower. But with flowers like the blackberry, it becomes a fleshy, sweet part that you eat with a blackberry. Here, the receptacle swells up. And again, this flower has many, many tiny ovaries and you end up with these tiny little nuts, little nutlets. It's the little, the little bumps on the surface of the strawberry. Each one of those is a tiny matured ovary. It's a tiny little akeem. So this is an aggregate, it's a single flower. Many ovaries are single flowers, so it's an aggregate of akeems. It just happens to be really fleshy and sweet because the receptacle of the flower um, um, yeah, it's the, the receptacle of the flower is what swelled up and, and the little ovaries were all around the outside, outside of that. So maybe more than you ever want to know about the things you eat, but it's always fun. fun. It makes eating lunch uh, at the lunch table with others. And we'll do that again one day, uh, makes it fun. We had a question in the chat. You kind of answered it, but I'll just ask it again in case there's anything you want to add. Um, right. How do like big agriculture companies cause seeds of fruits and veggies in the store not to be able to grow and produce flowers for reproduction? 
You mean like seedless? I guess the, the seedless fruits. I mean, I don't know. And in some cases, they may have just recognized a sport or a mutant strain and then propagated that because people don't like to eat their way around seeds. And so I don't know how often that's the story, but that's the story of a lot of horticultural things. The horticulturalists going back thousands of years watched the domesticated plants and picked out sports that were better in one way or another. And some seedless uh, seedless fruits, uh, maybe that, you know, with a, with a banana, it was a triploid hybrid. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, that's, that's one answer to the question. I'm not sure it was the right answer to that question. Um, Well, cool, thank you. That's all in the chat for now. Okay. Well, it seemed to be locked up. Oh, there we, there we go. So I just wanted to talk about another fruit. This is a, this is pineapple, which we usually get out of a can, but that's not where pineapples come from. I mean, you've probably seen the strange fruit in the store. Um, um, <laughs> so what's a pineapple? You know, we're talking about what fruits come from and, and a pineapple is not really a fruit. It's a whole, Mass of fruits is a multiple fruit. We talked about aggregate fruits with uh, with blackberries uh, and strawberries were aggregates. One flower produced many little ovaries that then sort of fused together in one way or another, or are contained in, in, in a single thing that we look at and call a fruit and eat. Whereas a pineapple is a product of many flowers arranged around a single axis. And you can see in the diagram there, each of these separate flowers and the whole thing then matures into what we think of as a pineapple. So it's a multiple fruit um, as opposed to an aggregate fruit. I mean, it's actually a group of many fruits because it's many ovaries that are matured into this single object we call a pineapple. Um, they do look like intelligent life forms. Uh, that there's just the, the right spacing of those dots. Uh, they look just like an animal looking at you. But coconuts are are you know weird. They're they're sort of all all the desert island cartoons have a coconut there, and one of the reasons. So you have the the coconut, the part you buy, is this central hard thing here, and it's surrounded by a huge fibrous covering. That is a part of the ovary and that covering makes it float. And so it can disperse from one island to another. Remember I said the ovaries often play that role in the life cycle of plants of moving the seeds around, providing some mechanism for the seeds to move, whether it's encasing the seed in an attractive fleshy sweet thing for birds to eat or developing wings so that seeds can fly on the air, or in this case, developing a, a flotation device like life preserver around the central seed to allow it to move from one island to another. And so those three pores, one of them is functional. That was the pore through which the pollen tube grew in its, in its uh, flower form, grew to fertilize the embryo inside, which develops just inside of the seed coat and then grows out. And this is the matured ovary. And so we have that same familiar structure of an avocado. We have the seed on the inside, the endosperm, which is here separated from hard endosperm, the, the coconut you used to grate. I was crazy about coconut when I was young. I didn't eat it that much as an adult. But, um, and then the endocarp, which becomes that hard wall around, around the coconut. And then the, 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 the mesocarp and exocarp, which are the big, fibrous mass around it all them to float. And some people, you'll hear people talk about the apple in a coconut. And if you let the seed germinate, the seed then creates this, this strange fibrous mass on the inside of the coconut. And what that does is it is it's is it's 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 it's, it's feeding on the nutrients of the coconut milk and then dissolving the meat of the coconut and feeding that to the embryo. Uh, it's it's actually the modified cotyledon of, of the coconut seed. So fascinating structure, coconut. Now just to talk about a few different vegetables, again, parts of plants and where they come from in the plant. And uh, some of them are what you think they are, and some of them are probably what you think they are. Um, so 
Here we're going to start off with two kinds of what we call potatoes. This is a sweet potato, and uh, you can see uh, uh, it's not a it's it's not a fruit. I'll give you that much. Uh, so uh, what is it? It's uh, it's not a, a um, so it's not a flower. This is this is a potato. Now these both of these come from underground, um, but they're really two different parts of the plant because with a potato, the potato is like when you make french fries or, or uh, hash browns or mashed potatoes. Um, potato is an underground storage organ where it's an underground stem that creates a storage organ. And we know it's a stem because it has buds and roots don't have buds. Um, uh, Rather, when a, when, a, when a root is growing and it branches off, the origin of that side branch is at the very core, the very core of that root, where, as opposed to a stem where the side branch comes from the bud along the periphery of the stem. So this is, when we see buds on a structure, we know it's a stem. This is a big swollen underground stem that has buds. And in fact, when you propagate potatoes, what do you do? You cut the eyes out and you plant them in the ground. Each of those eyes is a bud can grow into another potato plant. I mean, you can wait for the plant to flower and produce berries and then plant the berries and it will take several years before you get any potatoes to eat. But universally, when people propagate potatoes to eat, they just take an existing potato, cut the eyes out, put it in the ground, and they'll grow into the next plant. Now, there are little specks and things on the outside of the sweet potato, but there's something much more obvious here, and it's on most of the sweet potatoes we get, and these are roots. This is a swollen root. So this is what you expect to find underground is, are roots, uh, not underground stems. This is a swollen root, and we know that because we can see the roots coming off of it. So uh, two things we call potatoes, but from two different plant parts. One is an underground stem, that has buds, which we call eyes on a potato, that we use that pro to propagate the potato. And the sweet potato is just a swollen storage organ on the root. Uh, let's look at two tap roots. Um, a tap root, when, uh, when a seed germinates, and it sends down a single strong vertical root, like oak trees when they're seedlings, will stand down a strong tap root. Often with many oak species, that taproot then doesn't completely go away, but it becomes much more of a, uh, a finely branched root system after that. But initially it's a taproot. Things like the carrot keep that taproot. Now this is the domesticated carrot. We have wild carrots growing all over the place around here. We call them Queen Anne's lace. Same plant uh, that was domesticated. If you actually pull Queen Anne's lace out, uh, when the ground is soft and smell the root, it smells exactly like a carrot. It, believe me, if you try to eat it, it will be pretty woody, but uh, it smells just like a carrot. And so this is a tap root, and we cut, when we cut it open, we can see that in the center here is the xylem tissue. Now, roots, uh, roots have a very simple vascular structure. The core of a root is xylem tissue. Remember, xylem carries water from the roots upward. Uh, and uh, surrounding that is the phloem tissue. You can sort of see some modeling around the edge here. That's phloem tissue. That was carrying sugar solutions from the leaves produced by photosynthesis downward to the root. And in between the two is the vascular cambium there, that, that line right there. So all that you eat is the carrot. You generally peel it. Um, but uh, all of that, the, 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 uh, the xylem, the phloem, uh, and, and the vascular cambium, we eat the whole thing as a taproot. With a, with a beetroot, uh, this is another taproot. Again, swollen, uh, this one is layered in structure. I'm not quite sure. I would guess that's an artifact of its growth in layers. Uh, it almost implies sort of secondary growth like a tree. I'm not quite sure that I couldn't find any information about exactly how a beetroot grows, but um, it is a root, so the, so the, uh, this would be xylem tissue in, in here in the middle, and the phloem tissue would be arranged around the outside that was carrying sugar solutions downward 
from the uh, from the leaves which were here on the top and there's where most most of the actual water and nutrient absorbing roots were attached to the bottom of the beet root. And finally I wanted to show you two of my favorite plants when I cook. Uh, I'm not much of a cook but I've always said you dip garlic and olive oil and, uh, and onions together and you saute them around and after that whatever you add is always good. Um, so these are these are two two of my major culprits here. With the onions, um, this is these are both underground structures. These these, these came from the, from underground. So we're going to cut this onion open. Remember, larger knife next time. There we go. All right. So this is the orientation of the onion in the ground. The leaves will have come off this end, going up, and the roots would come off this end. And this little hard part of the onion at the base, if you do any chopping up vegetables, you, you know that right at the base there's a little hard part when you're dicing it up, it doesn't flake apart like the rest of the onion. That's the stem. That's what's left of the stem, is that little hard base there. Roots come off the base of it and go downward and so everything from there up is an above ground part of the plant. Even though this is below ground, it is an above ground part of the plant. These are leaves. The bulb is a mass of leaves and you can kind of imagine that when you look at it. Uh, the, all the, the fleshy leaves, layer after layer after layer of fleshy leaves, uh, and then they come off the top and you have the green part of the plant and the beautiful uh, well, Queen Anne's lace flower on top if you let it, let it grow that long. So that's, that's an onion bulb. It is a, it's an underground part of, of the, of the, it's the leaves and stem of the plant, but situated underground. So the garlic is a bit more puzzling because it doesn't look like it's divided into these cloves. into these funny shaped cloves and uh, each clove at this sort of squared off end is attaching to the equivalent of that, the stem. It's attaching to that hard base with what is left of the stem of an onion plant. It's attaching there and uh, in each one of these cloves is the equivalent of this. It is, uh, it, is, it is a set of very fleshy leaves. Now it's hard to see the individual leaves inside of a garlic clove, but um, you can see a, a slightly layered structure. And on the inside of that is, uh, we'll see if we can slice one where we can maybe see the, well there you can, you can see the, you could plant that, you can see the little embryo, embryonic flower or embryonic plant in there surrounded by these thick fleshy leaves. Um, so that's the garlic clove. It's really a miniature version. Many, many little miniature onion bulbs all clustered together. Same genus, Allium, even though the fruit ends up, or not the fruit, the part that you eat ends up looking very different. It's actually quite similar in structure. They're just many, essentially many little onion bulbs make up uh, a garlic head like this. So let's look at, uh, yeah, I know I'm Charlie, they're not all that bad. I, I used to think that when I was young, if it looked green, it wasn't any good. And it, my mother couldn't couldn't fool me. You know, peas, little green meanies, I used to call them rolling around on my plate. I try to corral them on one side so they didn't contaminate anything. Um, and uh, green was not my favorite color eating. Now I've, now I've learned to love vegetables, but uh, it, it took a long time. So all of these are, really parts of, of a plant. Uh, whoops. Uh, so we've got this, which really looks, this and the cauliflower, broccoli and cauliflower look like a plant and that's like what they are, very young plants that have come out of the ground that have been bred to stay relatively fleshy. Sometimes parts of the stalk of the broccoli start to get kind of woody and you don't want to eat them. But, um, uh, and then cabbage where you're, these are all, uh, Broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage are all the same species of plant that have been bred 
to produce very different looking structures, but all of which are edible. Cabbage, you eat this uh, mass of leaves. Um, uh, with asparagus, again, like broccoli and cauliflower, you're eating the shoot, the shoot as it comes out of the ground. Same with celery, these shoots. And with uh, actually a number, you have to think it was just bracken ferns, but it's a number of different ferns where the fiddlehead shoots, they come out of the ground are, are sliced off and eaten. I don't, I don't know that I've ever eaten fiddlehead. I need to do that one day. And then the, uh, um, oh no, I'm having another brain block. Unfortunately, on the, uh, on Zoom, there's no one from the audience to yell out. It's a, um, but this is a composite seed. I remember eating these when I was young and visited California. I'll think of it right after we, uh, we finish the presentation today, which we're pretty Artichoke. close to. Artichoke, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and so this is a composite seed head. These are the bracteal leaves or the involucre of a composite seed head that become fleshy on the inside and you actually eat them. So just another bizarre variant of that basic composite pattern. Uh, and with that, I want to thank you. Uh, this has been a, always a fun presentation to give. I love plants. I love looking at them. I love handling them and just looking at the incredible, even within simple things, when you look at them closely and you see the amazing diversity of structures and then start thinking about where that structure came from. I'm not sure which is me and which is Jackie here, but um, we both thank you for your attendance today. And now it's time for questions if you haven't asked them already. Are carrots from Queen Anne's lace poisonous? Can you eat them? Well, no, they're not poisonous, but they're, I mean, they, they've done some real selection over time. I've, carrots are biennial plants. And so when they send up a flower, then their second year and the root is very woody, but I've actually tried pulling up the first year carrots who can recognize the leaves and uh, they're still pretty chewy. Um, maybe if you got them in the very early spring, they went through a succulent stage in the root and probably that's true. And probably that's where people first started eating them and then propagated them to retain that soft fleshy root longer. But if you plant domestic carrots and you don't harvest them at the end of the year, they'll just create, as I haven't done this, but I've been told they just create a mass of green leaves in the next year, they bolt and flower, which is what, a, which is when you see Queen Anne's lace, it's a second year plant that's bolting and flowering. So the root isn't poisonous, but uh, it's probably, it's not very good to eat. It smells great, but it's not very nutritious, very woody. Do you have a good reference book or article to recommend about anything we covered today? Well, you know, I think we'll send that out um, send that out later. I can I can put together just a set of references for this to help. I mean, the, what my presentation covered a wide range of topics and no one source is gonna, gonna tell you very much. I used to use Botany for Gardeners, which was a popular book just for the basic way that plants grew in the basic structure of plants. I thought that was a really good one. So that's where I would start, but I'll, I'll try to send out something early next week uh, for, for attendees to, um, just for various places you can go to, to learn about them. I mean, what I always do now is I just start Googling things. It's a new, that's a verb that's become universal in our language. I just start Googling things and then Googling things that I find from Googling to figure out uh, things. And the, oh, oh, I wanted to say the beat. I said, I didn't know what that funny layered structure was, but that actually is secondary growth of the beet root, meaning it's putting on layers of, of in this case, fleshy, soft, sweet xylem tissue. And that's why the, 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 the beetroot has that banded structure to it. So again, I find that out just by poking around. But we'll, we'll get some resources out to you. The follow up to that question, just if they have any particular books for plant parts to help with the distinctions, those would be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Um, I mean, the thing to remember and I have to repeat it to myself over and over again is when I'm looking at a plant structure, often looking at a fruit or sometimes looking at a strange new flower from a florist is I just have to discipline myself. Sepal, petal, stamen, pistil or carpal. Sepal, petal, stamen, pistil. And start counting from the outside in and then asking myself for the inside out. They're always in that order and you can always, sometimes they look really strange but you can always determine the parts just by 
understanding that conserved order. We'll, we'll get some more resources out to you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the refresher. Some of this information I haven't thought about since college, especially the fruits. Yeah, well, those are the fun ones because you can eat them as you're as you're doing your dissections. Um, there's so many fruits. I mean, um, uh, I was uh, wearing Jackie out with a, I think that was almost a 20 minute video in its original take uh, and her arm was getting very tired, but I could have had twice as many fruits just could have a 40 minute video or a two hour video, that would have been too much. But um, yeah, there's just lots of things and it's just fun to take them apart and look at them. I know Tom made some uh, dinner with the garlic and onion afterwards. So. <laughs> Actually, I did. Um, yeah, I did. I did eat the uh, onion. I, I think, yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know if I ate that garlic. I did have onions and garlic and a little pasta for dinner that night. And the onion was actually the onion I cut open during the uh, during the presentation. Even the suggestion of onions and garlic and olive oil on pasta made me hungry. So, <laughs> let's see. We had a book recommendation: "Botany in a Day" is a good book that covers some of this stuff by Thomas Elpo. Good. Uh, any questions, feel free to add in the chat or unmute yourself. We've still got 10 minutes time allotted. So especially if anyone uh, cut up their fruits and flowers along with us, if you had any questions, now's a good time. Well, this is a this is the time to refresh on your flowers because they're going to be coming out in great great whole bunches here within the next few weeks. So, I always look forward to that. Each spring, each spring, I think I've forgotten everything I ever knew, uh, and uh, then you go out and you start seeing them, and the and the names and the the structures all just come back to you. It's just, I can't keep everything in a tip of your tongue and uh, just the, the appearance of the flowers and seeing them under the trees growing in the woods. Uh, just so exciting every spring. I hope, hope I never lose that. It's just a, it's like being born again every spring when you see all those new flowers. All right, we had a couple of questions pop up. Um, I didn't quite catch the thing in the middle of the coconut. Can you explain that again? All right, uh, remember uh, with seeds, uh, basic structure in seed is the, is the seed leaf. Uh, it's called the cotyledon and it serves many functions in a bean. Those are the first little flappers that come out when the, when the bean seed emerges. But within a coconut, the cotyledon stays inside of the seed and it develops into this essentially like a root system that is, uh, um, or sometimes called a hostorium, is absorbing nutrients from the milk and then I guess uh, maybe exuding some chemicals that help to dissolve the coconut meat, which is again, endosperm tissue that will feed the developing embryo. So that funny looking thing called the apple in the coconut is the, are the cotyledons, or sometimes called the hostorium, that are actually sort of like roots, but they're roots that are going inside of the seed to pull all of that nutrition out of the coconut. <laughs> are there any native plants you've been pleasantly surprised to see more of at all in recent years? Pleasantly surprised to see more of. I mean, I'm always pleasantly surprised uh, to see more. I haven't. Uh, I know of some native plants that I'm not pleasantly surprised to see more of. Uh, tall goldenrod has really been. Uh, it's funny when you become a land land manager, you're, you, you, the, the negatives always stick with you. That's just the way it is. And tall goldenrod has become quite a problem in prairies, where it's been there for 20 years, and all of a sudden, within the last few years, I've even documented it with some surveys that. The abundance is, has increased many fold um, just in the last few years for reasons none of us are quite aware of. And I suppose it might mysteriously be less common, um, but that's one that's native plant that has suddenly um, gone into a huge population increase. Um, yeah, I mean, in the springtime, they all have, a, well, it's not really a population increase, it's a visible increase. So that, that's the exciting part of the springtime. Good, several other thank yous. Um, 
The Visual Dictionary of Plants by Eyewitness Dictionaries has great photos and illustrations. I would encourage you to, to uh, study, study is a word that we all learned to hate when we were in school, but study or try to, try to take that plant structure seriously. It seems simple, but learning the basic plant structures and the arrangements makes it so much easier to learn new flowers uh, because you start seeing the things they're made up of. And you don't just see a sort of large blue thing versus a smaller yellow thing versus a medium sized red thing. You know, you, you start to see all the parts and it makes it so much easier to learn new flowers. So spend a little time, uh, if not going back to this video, uh, just looking on some resources, looking at basic plant structures and food structures and learning learning how they're put together because learning how plants are put together, I've often said in tree ID, I'm not really teaching you names, I'm teaching you how to see a tree because you've never seen one. You've seen a big green blob with a brown stick that goes into the ground, but you've never seen the tree until you learn to see all that it's made of. And when did you learn to see all that it's made of? Suddenly they all look different. All, all you need to do then is to apply names to them. Are nuts like a coconut? Well, nuts are one of the fruits I didn't put in there. It's a, a nut is a dry single seeded fruit. So a coconut isn't a nut, it's not dry. So I don't know what a coconut is. A coconut is a coconut. I mean, our fruit names are sort of general and some fruits sort of occur along the boundaries between two of these, two or three of these different types. Coconuts are one of those, but a nut is a dry single seeded fruit. The, it is a matured ovary, so an acorn is the matured ovary of, of the oak tree, uh, and inside of that is a single seed. Uh, most of, the, most of the, 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 the meat of the acorn is not endosperm, which is a specialized seed tissue, rather it's the cotyledons of, of, the, of the young plant. Those will stay below ground as the, as the little oak seedling uh, germinates. So um, yeah, and that is a single seeded dry fruit with a hard bony with a hard bony over over it, around it. All right, last chance for questions. <coughs> and you can always shoot us an email if you have questions afterwards oh, yeah. too that you don't think of until later. I love to have questions about plants, so. If you think of something tonight, jot it down and uh, send it in the morning or send it during the night and uh, I'll answer it in the morning. All right, I think that's about it. So thank you guys very much for joining us today. Uh, we don't currently have any additional time talks planned, so we'll just kind of stay tuned for later on if there's particular requests and depending on our schedules for the summer. So we're gonna be having all of our volunteer monitoring programs start up for the season too. Yeah, by all means, send, send your requests and ideas you'd like me to talk about. I mean, I, I don't like to do, teach classes about things I don't know about. So you may ask questions I can't answer, but if I look at the sorts of things that you're interested in, I can often find something within that that would be the subject of our, of our one of our next Tom Talks. So by all means, send your cards and letters to Jackie and uh, we'll, we'll, um, we'll try, to, try to address them if we can. Great, anyway, have a wonderful day. Goodbye for now. <laughs>